Dr. Abed Ali Qureshi is coming from the Children's Hospital as head of the radiology department. You all understand that neuroimaging, both diagnostic and interventional, is the way to the future without advancement in neuroimaging. There will remain a lag between the diagnosis and management. So you've got a very senior person, a lot of experience. Please welcome Dr. Abid, who share his knowledge about the new trends in neuroimaging. Dr. Abid Ali Qureshi. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, organizers, for giving me an opportunity to talk about the neuroimaging in units. Uh, it's no doubt that, that uh, some of the talk has already been discussed directly or indirectly regarding the neuroimaging in neurons. As far as the imaging of neonatal brain is concerned, uh, what we have in the radiology. One is the cranial ultrasound, and then second is the CT scan, and third one is the MRI. Cranial ultrasound is the best imaging modality, uh, which is radially available at the bedside, no radiation side effects, and obviously this has got a majority of the chunk, majority of the diseases can be picked up with this very simple investigation and very easy to grab the uh, expertise by the neonatologist as well. So the technique and the machine has already been improved a lot. As far as the CT scan is concerned, there has been a lot of debate regarding the indication between CT and MRI. Remember one thing, that the CT scan carries the ionizing radiation. And uh, when we talk about, uh, I have just skipped the advantages of the cranial ultrasound. As far as the advantage is considered, the most bigger advantage is the lack of ionizing radiation. It is portable and easily available and does not require any special preparation on the behalf of patient. And the technology has improved a lot. Uh, uh, we have a new machines available, which are very smart in size and even uh, we uh, have the probes, only the probe that can be connected to the modern devices like iPad, tablets, or the, uh, your phones, and images can be displayed in a much better way at the bedside of a newborn. Second most important thing, the disadvantage is that we cannot identify all the diseases of newborn by using this cranial ultrasound. Convex surfaces and the posterior fossa structures are not well visualized. And the second most important thing is operator dependent. If the operator has the expertise to perform cranial ultrasound, he or she can pick the findings. Otherwise, it may become very difficult. And the other thing, some of the subtle gray white matter abnormalities may be missed on ultrasound. When it, is, when it comes to the congenital anomalies, it's a structural defect, hemorrhage, ventricular dilatation means hydrocephalus, ultrasound is the good modality at the bedside of the newborn. But uh, when we come, when we, uh, when we talk about the encephalopathy, the neonatal infections, specifically meningitis and sequelae and encephalitis, we have to go for the cross-sectional imaging. As far as the CT is concerned, as already said, that this carries the ionizing radiation that carries risk to the radiation related effects. And that should be avoided as possible in infant age group. And the most important other thing, it is not the ionization effect only that we should avoid the CT scan for uh, neonates, it's the capability of CT scan is not much enough to identify the gray and white matter abnormalities. And because of the abundant of the water content in the white matter, sometimes CT may not show you the early changes of asphyxia related abnormalities. So because of the lack of myelination in the newborn brain, the gray white matter contrast is not clearly visible on CT scan. So this is not considered the ideal investigation. And in general, when we compare with CT versus MRI, a uh, majority of the abnormalities in cases of encephalopathy that related to the basal ganglia thalamic complex or the gray white matter, these are better depicted with the MRI compared to the CT scan. So CT scan, because of the two factors, presence of due to use of the ionizing radiation, and the second thing, the lack of capability of various diseases of neonates, CT is not preferred investigation, except in few cases. 
uh, where the child is restless, irritable, is not stable, and cannot be shifted to the MRI properly, where the monitoring uh, of, the, of these children is much more important in the MRI suit, and the MRI takes more time compared to the CT scan. So in such a situation, you can refer the, these patients for CT as compared to the MRI. So when, it, when we talk about the indication of CT scan, then it means when MR is not available or when patient is not comfortable enough to be shifted to the MRI, when we cannot afford the long scanning time of MR, or there is history of trauma or you want to rule out the presence of fractures as well. In such situation, you can choose the CT scan as the other alternate investigation, but not the primary imaging of choice. As far as the MRI is concerned, because of its better soft tissue contrast, and in certain terms, there are certain sequences which can quantify the brain abnormalities. The advent of new sequences like diffusion-weighted MRI, the ADC, and the spectroscopy, and now the white matter tractography, these are the modern uh, uh, advanced applications in MRI, which gives a much better uh, clue to the diagnosis, particularly when we, we talk about the neonates. There is no radiation risk in MRI and increased diagnostic accuracy and patient safety far outweigh the cost of MR. The advantage of MR is that the cost of nullify in certain diseases. But no doubt, we, we do need to transfer the patient at, at risk newborn to a higher level of care. We need a higher level of care in MRI. When we talk about the higher level of care, it means we need the proper monitoring devices in MR, which should be MR compatible. And every monitoring device in the MRE room should not contain the ferromagnetic component within that, that, within that particular monitoring device. So this is the main uh, uh, point which uh, we cannot afford in that MRE area if it takes half an hour. We have to keep in mind we don't uh, <coughs> afford the patients to wait in the MRE suite just for the imaging. And the second most important thing is the monitoring. Contraindications, any presence of metallic device inside the body or outside the body or metallic foreign body, this is absolute contraindication because of the strong magnetic waves within the magnet and within that MRA suite. And even the every monitoring equipment should not be having mere ferromagnetic component should not be allowed within the MRA room. Even the IV pole, IV stand, the, the, the transport devices that should not contain the uh, ferromagnetic foreign body or metallic uh, uh, component, which is not compatible to the MRI. And the other most important thing is the appropriate positioning of these neonates. Swaddling and the time of feed, we have to sedate these children in certain situations and we can avoid this sedation if we go for the proper positioning, swaddling, the timing of feed, that can help to optimize the effective scanning without the need of pharmacological read of uh, sedation. We can avoid, but in certain situations, we have to sedate the children. But this sedation will be uh, in a very meticulous way that you either use the oral sedative drugs or IV sedative drugs according to the clinical situation of the patient. And the most important thing is the development of MR compatible transport. When we talk about the MR compatible transport, there are MR compatible wheelchairs, trolleys, and uh, 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 there are certain tables as well. But these are designed for the adult size patients. For new dates, we don't have proper incubators. There are availability of MR compatible incubators in a size that they can be put into the magnet. But the size, the drowned size of the magnet is not sufficient enough to accommodate, the, to accommodate the larger sizes of the incubator. So this facility is not available everywhere. As far as the guideline is concerned, ultrasound is considered to be the first imaging modality, provided the trained and experienced technologists and radiologists are available. And the second most important thing, we, the ultrasound is helpful as far as the identification of hemorrhage is concerned, major structural abnormality, partial or complete agenesis of corpus callosum or Danny Walker malformation, calcification, but it is not recommended for those situations when the patients suffer from moderate to severe encephalopathy. The diagnosis of encephalopathy, either this is clinical or is based on the advanced imaging like MRI, not merely on basis of ultrasound findings. Now, as far as I had already pointed out, where we can 
order the CT scan when MR is not available. Second thing, when an infant is not uh, comfortable enough to shift to the MRI suite, or it is not stable to undergo for longer time of MRI examination. And the third one, when there is history of trauma and you have to look for the uh, skull bone fractures. As far as the MR uh, guidelines are concerned, this is the imaging uh, technique of choice, specifically in term and preterm babies who present with encephalopathy with suspected brain injury or the abnormality. I will highlight the, where the MRI can be very helpful in such a situation. I will now focus the brief overview regarding the uh, uh, proper use of MR in our limited uh, uh, circumstances. Number one, so, sorry, the MR is frequently increasing being used for the developing brain. It provides the diagnostic and prognostic information for the optimal treatment and appropriate counseling. The most important thing is the special care within the scan room. And this special care needs the special transport. Transport means that whenever uh, we are shifting this patient to the MRI suite, the timing should be, in, uh, should be properly managed. These patients should not be kept waiting in the MRI rooms. Monitoring the vital signs, every monitoring devices should be MR compatible. I'm not going to the, into the various details, but remember one point that various monitoring devices, they do have somehow the other metallic component. This should not be allowed into the MRI system and then optimizing the MRE sequences and protocol. This is a very important component which falls on the part of our operator and the radiology team. When we talk about the optimizing the MRE sequences, machines are basically made for the general population and mostly for the adult uh, 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 size patients. And in, when it comes to the pediatric imaging, there is very small chunk of the patients we come for the, this particular age, neonate. When we talk about the neonate, we have to understand the and uh, the basic physics of the MR sequencing and the related to the protocols to just properly, just to enable these equipment to use in a way that in the shortest period of time, we can diagnose the various neurological disorders. And the second most important point, this has already been discussed, accurate interpretation. When it comes to the interpretation of MRI, this is very important to know about the anatomy of a newborn because of the specific knowledge about the images, because of the physiological process of myelination, the cell migration, the cell cation, and the pattern of injury, pattern of injury and the age of the gestation as well. So keeping all these factors in mind, we will be able to use the MRI sequences properly. If you invited MRI, MR spectroscopy and tractography, these are the advanced applications and now available in majority of the public sector hospital as well. They depict the abnormalities earlier than do the conventional MR imaging sequences. <clears throat> in neonatal brain, uh, hypoxic ischemic injury is the most common cause of neonatal encephalopathy and imaging appearance depends upon the severity and dur duration of the illness and as well as the stage of the brain development. And the most important amongst all the available sequences, uh, I, I will show a few of the images, T1, T2, flare and out of all these diffusion weighted images, which are much more sensitive, but when it is acquired within the first 24 hours of the insult, this will underestimate the extent of injury. So timing is also important. Timing of the image is also important. The imaging acquired within 24 hours of the ischemic insult, in spite of having a very good capability of diffusion weighted images, that may underestimate. So these are the, there are multiple factors to have the proper outcome of these imaging sequences. And the most important other point that hypoxic ischemic injury is not the only cause of uh, neonatal uh, encephalopathy. There are other causes as well. So when these, the clinical findings and the MRA findings are atypical or not matched, then at least consider the other differentials as well, like congenital, metabolic, or the infective etiology. When we, it comes to the interpretation of MRI in a newborn, the most important point is the clinical history. Prenatal history, history during the delivery, is there any episode of asphyxia, the APGAR score, and the postnatal period history. So clinical history is much more important, rather this is very important in every patient coming to the radiology department, but in particular when we're talking about the neurological disorders of a newborn, 
this clinical history is much more important to read the diagnosis. At least we should know the various causes of the neonatal encephalopathy and I will just discuss few of the normal and abnormal appearances of the MRI. This I have already uh, talked about regarding the preparation and transport. The second most important thing is the dedicated MR compatible incubators. These are available, but unfortunately not available in Pakistan right now. But what we can do, we can have a small built-in coils. We can have a small coil. Small coils, when you talk about the small coils, means adult uh, uh, MRI brain coil is not ideal for the newborns. We have to use the small sized head coil to have a better SNR, to have a better MR images. And when we talk about the technique, the most important thing is the selection of MRI system. Lots of systems available in the private sector are of open MRI. You might have heard the, you might have heard the word of open uh, MRI or permanent, permanent MRI system. And second one is the superconducting magnet. Never send newborns to the open MRI systems because 1.5 Tesla at least is the minimum requirement of an MR having capability to perform the proper sequences of MRI. And open MRI system will lead to lengthy times, longer time examination, longer time of the scans. And not only it will take the longer time, but this will not be able to generate a high SNR. SNR means signal to noise ratio. This is the hallmark of the quality of an MRI. Having high SNR means we will be able to see the changes of myelination. We will be see the changes of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Otherwise, the other system, the open MR system, will not be able to show all these changes. Even the normal anatomy will be not clearly seen on these images. And this, how to get this high SNR, apart from the strength of the magnet, the smaller head calls. And these are available. At the buying time, you have to buy the separate uh, small head coils for the new nates. Whenever you will consider the buying of these equipments, wherever the neonatology setup is present, you will improve the quality of imaging, specifically when there is high SNR. Adult brain coil, which I already pointed out with large few, we will not be able to show the anatomical detail in a better way. The neonatal brain has long T1 and T2. Why? Because it contains more water content compared to the fit, uh, lipids. Abhi myelination process in process hai, to because of the abundant of white matter, how we have to nullify this effect on MRI. This is one technical parameter that when we talk about it, optimize and to increase the SNR. One is the selection of 1.5 Tesla system, other is the small head size coil, and third point is the TR. What is TR? Time of repetition is the technical factor of every sequence. We have to increase this TR to enable the system that we can see both T1 and T2 or diffusion weighted images in a much better way. This is a very simple technique because most, most of the operators, they pick the adult protocol and apply over a pediatric age group patient or a neonate. This will lead to uh, loss of detail. Here you can see, uh, uh, which I'm trying to show you, if you look at images, dekhe, to there is a subtle difference. If you identify kar pa rahe ho, left image look relatively better compared to the right side. Sorry. This image is relatively clear compared to the, this image. And this has become, this has been acquired at the same gestational age, same age group, with the same system, but having 800 TR of this system and 400 TR of this image. So just by increasing the TR, you can just slightly improve the quality of image. We have to see the much detail. Here you can see the white matter the posterior limb sign of the normal myelination at term. And similarly, I can give you the other example. So this image has got the more detail related to the white matter and gray matter. And this is a relatively dull image. So by increasing the TR, you will increase the scanning time, but you will improve the quality at the same time. Merely the presence of 1.5 Tesla does not mean that the responsibility has been finished. Even if the three Tesla system, you will have to optimize these sequences to get the better results. As far as the normal myelination is concerned, the T1 weighted are much better compared to the T2 weighted images. And we usually see the T1 uh, in this age group specifically to see the normal areas of myelination. 
And this starts from caudal to rostral, from posterior to anterior or center to the periphery. But these are the three important points that where we have to look for the white matter. The children born at 24 to 28 weeks of gestation, the dorsal brainstem undergoes myelination. This is the way we pick the age of uh, 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 myelination, particularly by looking at T1-weighted sequences. And subthalamic nucleus and ventrothalamus nucleus undergoes again at the age of 28. And the posterior limb of internal capsule, which I highlighted in the previous slide, was at around the th 36 weeks of gestation. Now here you can see, this is the dorsal brainstem. Dorsal means posterior part of the brainstem. This is pons, this is cerebellar peduncle, and this shows hyper intense appearance of myelination. This is normal myelination at the age of 28 weeks. And again, you can see, the, this is the ventrodorsal aspect of the uh, <coughs> subthalamic nuclei, again showing the hyperintense appearance on T1, and this is the 36 weaker child, uh, neonate, which shows the hyperintense appearance along the posterior limb of internal capsule. So by looking at the T1 MR, you can, uh, at least you can correlate with the uh, gestational age of the child. And these are the areas where you have to look for the normal myelination. Now causes of the encephalopathy, no doubt hypoxic ischemic injury is the most common cause than the other including the infectious metabolic trauma and the congenital causes. And hypoxic ischemic injury, when we talk about the hypo hypoxic ischemic injury, it should not be confused with the hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. The injury means uh, impair brain impairment caused by the insufficient oxygenation and blood flow, while the encephalopathy is basically is a condition based on the specific clinical finding you better know uh, than me. But when we talk about the hypoxic ischemic injury, this is a radiological term, which is being used more frequently when we come across to the MR imaging. Again, the most important point, the clinical history is much more important when we talk about the encephalopathic neonates. Gestation age is very important when we're talking about the hypoxic ischemic injury. And the time lag, time lag means the time between hypoxic ischemic insert and the MR study. This is also very important. If we have done the imaging uh, within a very short period of time, as I've already pointed out, if this scan is done before the 24 hours of the ischemic insult, we may underestimate the changes. So these three are the very important point. Now, what about the various uh, sequelae of these ischemic insults? If it is occur 28 weeks, before the 28 weeks of gestation, that it will end up into the hyrencephaly and the porencephaly. What is hyrencephaly and porencephaly? These are the cystic spaces occupied by the by, uh, created by the loss of tissue. And that loss of tissue leads to accumulation of the fluid. And 38 to 32 weeks, this, may be, this will lead to periventricular or intraventricular hemorrhages. Between 30 to 36 weeks, partial asphyxia will lead to PVL, uh, periventricular leukomalacia. And if it is profound ischemia, this will lead to involvement of thalami, cerebellum, and brainstem with relative late involvement of basal ganglia. And now come to the images. This is the cranial ultrasound, sagittal and coronal images. Here you can see the law, these are the large cystic areas. Only barely you are able to see the midline post, uh, thalami and the cerebellar structures. And here we are not able to identify the brain cortex. This represents the injury of the skull is, is all filled with the fluid. This is called hyrencephaly. And this usually occurs in the newborns who were born uh, before the age of 28. Now here, this is the uh, Im imaging of a, a relatively uh, later age group of child, large cystic area. This is communicating with the right lateral ventricle. So when cystic area communicates with the fifth uh, lateral ventricle, this is called porencephalic cyst. Again, this is a sequelae of old ischemic insult. Now this is the general matrix hemorrhage on cranial ultrasound. And here another patient showing intraventricular hemorrhage with ventricular dilatation, sagittal and coronal images, grade three general matrix hemorrhage. And here you can identify this hyper echoic appearance is the choroid plexus, but this cystic area, which is lies in the left anterior parietal region on coronal images. And here we, we can see on the left parasitical images, this represents the PVL, periventricular leukomalacia. Now, these are the T2-weighted and T1-weighted MR images, large cystic areas, almost occupying whole of the brain parenchyma in the both cerebral hemispheres with ventricular dilatation. 
this is again a case of PVL. Here, uh, the T1, I think, properly not being displayed, but this, these are the cystic areas in the both ventricular areas, again, a case of PVL. And here you can see uh, irregular wavy margin of the ventricles with hyperintense appearance along the atria, both lateral ventricles. These are the flare coronal image, and this is the T2-weighted image. These are the relatively images of a children of a later age group, but this, these ischemic foci represent the ischemia or in the newborn. So these are the late term sequelae or the chronic changes of the PVL. Again, a case of PVL. When we come to the term infants, the acute profound ischemia that affects the high oxygen demanding area like basal ganglia thalamic complex and prolonged partial asphyxia that affects as it, that lead to watershed infarcts as already, already pointed out by Professor Dr. Shahid, that the, these are the two different mechanism, but area of involvement is different in both of these cases. As far as the HIE is concerned, as I already pointed out, ultrasound is only better to show the hemorrhage, leukomalacia, and hydrocephalus. But CT scan, because of the poor parenchymal contrast, is not considered to be the ideal one. Here, there are some cases. One of the image of the diffuse image at the same age group this is the normal neonate, and this is the neonate having the same age group. Here you can see the diffusion restriction in the basal ganglia and the occipital areas. So this again represents the sequelae of the asphyxia, the hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Here on T1-weighted images, subtle changes on basal ganglia, and these changes are better seen on diffusion-weighted images. Again, a case of uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Here, only the two type of images are shown. This is the diffuse image, and this is the ADC, which why I was talking about. If you acquire the proper DW and ADC, you will be able to see the changes of HIE much more clearly on the MRI. This is, again, uh, a normal uh, neonate showing the normal appearing posterior limb of internal capsule, same age group. Now look at the T1 appearance, the swollen appearance of basal ganglia with ventrolateral involvement of thalami. So this is the typical appearance of HIE on, uh, in a full-term baby, that here, this is the posterior limb of internal capsule showing the normal uh, myelin pa pathway, but in this particular area, this shows the abnormal signals on T1-weighted images. T2-weighted images, subtle hypointense appearance, but when it becomes bright on T2, that again, uh, uh, typical changes of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Now, this is another uh, uh, new sequence, new, we cannot label it as a new, rather this is being used for the last 12, 13 years. This is called T2 star. T2 star is a sequence of MRI which has the capability to identify the small hemorrhages. Here, the MRI can replace the uh, CT scan indication. Apart from the uh, identification of the ischemia, but few of the sequences, not all sequences can show you the hemorrhage much, much more clearly. Rather, the T2 star image, it, this is the normal T2 star, you can see the brain parenchyma, no abnormality. And this black patches is diagnostic for hemorrhagic foci. This is called bloom artifact. This is typical diagnostic for small hemorrhagic foci. To identify the small hemorrhages, this sequence is best sequence. Spin, uh, 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 one is the spin echo, another one, which is most commonly employed these days, is the T2 star. So this uh, bloom artifact of the type T2 hypointense foci represent the small hem area of hemorrhages. This is the typical uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy picture on, uh, in a full-term neonate, uh, having T1 hyperintense, T2 hyperintense flare, rather, this shows dark appearance on ADC. ADC, this is again a diagnostic point related to the infarction or the ischemia. Now, these are the encephalomalacia changes in the both frontal and the occipital areas. And here you can identify the flattening of the gyri. So these are the late term consequences of the hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Now, by looking at the Jobita company image, they came, DW, this is again a DWB showing hyperintense signals and involving the splenium of corpus callosum and occipital lobe. We usually assume them as ischemia, but when we look at the MRI, that as already I have talked about the correlation with the clinical history. If this is not core, if this happens after the five or six day of life, then this cannot be the hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy only. 
we cannot differentiate between hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy changes due to ischemia or due to metabolic causes. We can differentiate structure, we can label the infection, we can label the structural abnormalities, but we cannot differentiate between, for metabolic, we have to go for the uh, single voxel spectroscopy. If spectroscopy is performed, that can lead us to the neurometabolic disease. So this patient was uh, later on turned uh, on clinical examination as a uh, some uh, metabolic disorder. Here you can see the globus pallidi bilateral involvement. We can label only hypoxic ischemic injury. But again, the patient was having neonatal acute ictus. Sometimes uh, the unconjugated high bilirubin level, they can cross the blood brain barrier and lead to uh, changes in the basal ganglia. So the point is that radiology people cannot differentiate if we, uh, between ischemic hypoxic encephalopathy causes due to ischemia or due to some metabolic causes. So you have to correlate with the clinical and lab investigations. Again, hyperintense signal involving basal ganglia, brainstem, and cerebellum. So again, on urine analysis, this was proved to be maple syrup urine syndrome. We do not perform MR spectroscopy as per routine until unless it is requested by the clinician. So this is not a policy, at least at our hospital right now, because of the overburden of the, because of the long queue of the patient, because MR spectroscopy takes a bit longer time compared to the conventional scanning. So when we have to add the spectroscopy, this will help to diagnose this metabolic disorders as well. Again, a large defect. This is the congenital defect leading to frontal encephalocene in a one-month-old child. Hydrocephalus can easily be diagnosed on the ultrasound, but these are the, just a few slides to show you the, how the hydrocephalus look like. And here on this case, T1, uh, DW images, flare images showing uh, uh, ventricular dilatation with intraventricular hemorrhage and the chronic ischemic changes in the left cerebral hemisphere as well. Now here you can see identify the parallel orientation of the uh, ventricular, ventricle, high rising third ventricle and absence of corpus callosum. So again, it's a structural abnormality, uh, which can easily be diagnosed with the help of ultrasound as well, but MRI because of which multi-planar and multi-sequential capability can give you the more details, specifically its association with the gray matter heterotropia. So MRI helps you a lot to rule out its associations to see on various sequences. So conclusion, amongst all, uh, radiological modalities, only ultrasound and MRI are useful when, whenever we talk about the imaging in the newborn. But MRI has the uh, investigation of choice because uh, specifically in the encephalopathic neonates. And the most important catch point is the opt optimization of the acquisition technique. Even if you have the 1.5 or 3 Tesla system, if you had, have not optimized these sequences, if you have not achieved the target of high SNR, we cannot have the good quality imaging specifically in newborns. Acute, accurate interpretation. Yes, I do agree that uh, all the radiology team uh, are not uh, having the capability of uh, reading the imaging of the MRI. This, you have to learn the normal physiological process of myelination, the cell migration, cell cation, and all the development process and how the myelin myelination charts are being compared. So when you uh, develop a habit to looking at these myelinated pathways on MRI, you will be uh, more easy to diagnose such abnormalities. Hypoxic ischemic is said the most common cause of encephalopathy has characteristic MRI pattern that vary according to the degree of brain maturity and severity of the insult. So it is not necessary that different types of insult or different age groups are so you have to match them. Clinical history, again, say this much more important in patients when we are dealing with the cases of newborns. And when clinical history and imaging findings are unusual, unusual, I do say simply that when they are mismatched, that always consider the other causes. Thank you. And I have tried not to take too much time. Uh, I'm, I will be happy to answer the questions in the next subsequent session. Thank you very much.